Welcome back to Atlanta Diaries. I'm your host Enma Popley. Thank you for joining me. In Atlanta Diaries, we celebrate unique and inspiring stories of breakthrough women to help future generations create their own. If you want to know more about Atlanta or listen to more episodes, you can visit my website www.enmapopley.com. You can also share feedback or suggestions there. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Bhavani Vadla Modi. She's the Vice President of MRO Digital at GE Aerospace. She's truly a trailblazer. With an innovative approach and expertise in ERP transformations, Bhavani has brought about revolutionary changes in the business landscape. Bhavani is originally from small town Guntur in India and began a professional journey as a computer teacher at Aptek Computers, a local training institute. Driven by her passion for technology and a burning desire to make a broader impact, Bhavani transitioned and pivoted into the world of IT. She has played a key role in building high-performance center of excellence teams, delivering exceptional outcomes and implementing visionary IT strategies and solutions for the manufacturing and service domains, and therefore affectionately earned the title of ERP Queen from business leaders in multiple GE businesses. Beyond the professional achievements through coaching and mentoring, Bhavani has positively impacted careers of over 200 women at various stages, fostering their retention and facilitating upward growth. Join me as we dive into Bhavani's extraordinary journey. I am still in awe of her truly remarkable story of candor, courage, and commitment. Hi, Bhavani. Welcome to Atlanta Diaries, and thank you for taking out time to do this conversation. Thank you, Anma, for having me here. Delighted. Without further ado, I'm just going to jump into your inspiring journey. I know your mom and dad played a huge role in defining your early years, so I'd love for you to share that with our listeners. Absolutely. For me, my early career started in a small town slash big village kind of an environment where there were some social expectations on you as a girl child. But I think I have got enough freedom. because of my pampering parents at the same time you know a loving family around who really took care of me very well and i totally enjoyed my childhood with their upbringing my mom is not so educated and think in her days she passed her 7th grade which was kind of a big deal at that time for her coming out of a village so she definitely understands the importance of education although i am not afraid to say my beginnings were very humble my mom was a housewife and my dad was a truck driver they struggled to make the ends meet but my mom has always this insight that if a woman gets educated in the family she can best take care of that family and she can be the power to lead that family towards driving more into the limelight and make best decisions for her and that's the plan that she had seeded in me saying as a woman it is your responsibility to make sure you're educated enough for you to take care of your family it was not that hey you should learn how to cook you should learn how to clean the house what were the initial expectations that were set on me about how i should start as a woman and i don't recall my mom even telling me to do certain things in my childhood that hey you should learn how to sweep the house how should clean the house but her focus is all on ways tell me what you want i will take care of you you go study and she did that extra work although there were not a lot of jobs in that small town for women to do anything she sold milk which she completely set aside that funding for me and my brother to go to a convent there were a lot of other public schools where we could have gotten a cheaper education but she made sure that we got the best education even though at that point they couldn't afford it amazing you know it's such a coincidence we're just around the corner with mothers day and just this morning i have prepared a post where till today we've covered 23 episodes in atlanta diaries and i think around 10 of the women have paid tributes to their moms so i wish you and i had spoken earlier and i'm only looking forward to adding more tributes next year this time so at this point of time huge respect for your mom and kudos to her to bring up bhavani and allow us this conversation so you must convey my regards to your mother for this itself 
Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, I think she's the driving force behind me to begin with. And yeah, I know we celebrate Mother's Day in the US, but I think every day you need your mother's backing for you to be able to lead your life successfully. Totally. In the same lines, Bhavani, tell me how were your father's lessons different from that of your mother's? And any reflections come to your mind when I ask you that question? Fortunately, I've had great men in my life who paved the path for me for who I am today. Although my mom was explaining me the importance of education and how it's important for a woman to be financially independent, to be able to give better future for their family. I think at some point, again, my dad was an illiterate. He did not go to school or, or anything. And I think probably he learned how to do a signature with the help of my mom for his driving license so that he, he can drive the truck. That's all he knows from an education standpoint. But I think at some point he always thought that it's important that a woman has to be independent, courageous, to be able to succeed. For some reason, he always had this expectation on me. And you know, generally, when it comes to strength and muscle power and ability to take care of someone is well associated with male gender and not female gender. So my dad always used to refer me as, she's my elder son. And I want to share an incident which it kind of made me reflect more on how it was helpful for me in the journey. And maybe this is something that I want to share to the audience as well, who are dads of girls and younger women. When I was in my teens, there was a lot of eve teasing problem in my hometown where it was not easy to deal with because you don't know what kind of comments you would listen to. And not always are true. And, you know, sometimes it is derogatory, deteriorating your confidence. And one day I faced with that and I went with a red face to my home and my dad asked me, hey, what's wrong? And I did explain that there was a bunch of guys sitting over there and just passing on, you know, teasing comments that had an impact on me. And he was like, why didn't you slap them right there? So sweet. <laughs> and now that I reflect on it, he did not point fingers at me saying, what did you do for them to be able to say something? I heard that from my other friends where they were always asked to walk heads down. But that response from my dad was his expectation on me was, chin up lady, go take care of your problem by yourselves. And that is the spirit that he instilled in me saying, one, I need to deal with the problems and not be sympathetic about it and reach out or cry for help. And two, the next day when I actually did it, I was almost at the point to kick those people where my dad was behind me and he told me, okay, that's enough. I will take care of these guys. Now you go home. You don't get hurt. Wow. That's such a powerful story. And that told me, I don't know if I had enough strength to do it, but I need to be confident and courageous to be able to do that. And the support will naturally come in. That's my biggest lesson in my life. If I reflect on any decisions that I have made thus far, it's all about the confidence and courage that helped me make those choices in life. The learnings from mom is different from dad only because of the reason moms come from a point where she says, this is important for you, but you have to go with the society. Wherein dad is, you need to have your own courage and confidence to be able to deal with your problems to face the society not necessarily go with the society. And they beautifully actually complemented each other, right? So in a sense, both of them prepared you from both angles. And that's just absolutely powerful. Thank you very much for sharing this, Bhavani. Let's shift gears a little bit. So you told me earlier that you were part of faculty in college. So from a faculty in college to engineering, what triggered that decision for you to pivot and how did you stay committed to that goal? Because you mentioned that your son was only two years old when you signed up for the engineering program and you had to travel to another city to make that happen. And that's no mean feat. So in the small town, again, as I said, there were social expectations on you. And by the time I was 16 year old, the pressure came on my dad that I need to get married. 
although I was punting on that for a couple more years because one, I had to complete my associate degree that I was doing at that time. And to my mom's expectation that I really wanted to get a job even before doing anything else in my life. And so I was able to land in a, a college as a faculty to support their associate program students. During that time, I think I had my own reflection in terms of, hey, I landed in a good job. I got married in the same hometown to a family that is close by. I had a two-year-old son. And life is coming to a completion, you know, in terms of the definition for a woman. Satisfied, right? As my mom expected, I was independent. As the society wanted, I got married. And to happily live ever after I have a son. It's that state of contentment that you reach. Thinking that, okay, I have everything around me that I want. What else do I need? And when I was getting into that mode, I had this conversation with my dad one day. My dad was watching TV and he said, when a woman leader was actually talking in a mic, I think a politician or somebody, I don't remember. And he was like, wow, such a great orator. She was talking really important points and look at her courage. We both admired her courage, her appreciation. I believe it was Indira Gandhi. She was on a TV once and now I, I recall, I think it was Indira Gandhi. Me and my dad chatted about her for a while in terms of how courageous she was and how Amadmi, you know, kind of attitude that she went into people and all. There's nothing about political. It's more about how a woman is independent and how she would lead the nation. I had this reflection in me in terms of, that's the example for my dad when he said I was his elder son. And I'm, I'm so happy living ever after here. Am I meeting the expectation? Am I good enough for my dad? So I went back to my husband and I said, hey, I want to do my engineering. He was extremely supportive. I said, oh yeah, if you want to go back to college, that's fine. We will support you. And I bounced off that idea with my own parents and my mother-in-law, my father-in-law and my husband, and everybody was super supportive. My son was only two years old. And, and then I, I went ahead with that. Unfortunately, when I registered for my college is when my dad passed away. The whole, the whole reason for me to take that path was my dad. And when he passed away, I was even more committed that I have to stick to it and complete my engineering graduation. So that's how I, I was able to get into it and complete it after I got married and, and had a son. Almost like that TV uh, scene was meant to happen, right? It almost like was a message to his daughter rather than just getting inspired by a leader. Wow, that's beautiful. It was somebody giving you that message, right? Sending you some vibes in terms of enough of your happiness, there's more for you to do in life. Yeah. Were there any fears or, you know, were there any moments when you sort of felt that, will I be able to do this or not? Any doubts? It's a very good question, Emma. I think beating fears is something it's extremely important for you to build confidence. Confidence doesn't just come as is. My biggest fear in my childhood was, it's interesting, and maybe people might smile if you don't have the context and, and relation to what the situations were at that point. I always dreamt of our house being on fire because I saw one of our friends go through that situation. I always dreamt of that. That was my biggest fear. And the only thing at that point for me was when I grow up, I have to have something that cannot be burnt, like, you know, a concrete roof or something over, over the head. Oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps listening to you. Again, you know, as a child, you don't know what you go through. And I always used to dream of that. And I always used to have nightmares about it. But eventually, when you get things under control, and if I reflect back on the point of happily living ever after, after I got married, my husband's family had reasonable wealth. I would say at that time for us to be able to live in, in a more secure house. And it was no longer a nightmare for me. So it took care of that fear. And once that fear is done, I think that's when the actual other reflection had started. And I think it's important that you need to have the courage in you to be able to fight that. You know, I want to give you another example here. Again, with all the society limitations, the expectation in my in-laws family is that I wear a sari and I was only 19 when I got married. <laughs> and sari is an Indian outfit, which probably is the only single costume for my mother, mother-in-law, whoever, all the elderly parents. 
and that's not so comfortable in the current world where you know you think of women playing different roles not just a household responsibility but that was the expectation it was not something that i could easily accept because with my dad's upbringing i was pretty much wearing all sorts of fashion clothes including <laughs> jeans well before marriage but suddenly after marriage when your whole life transforms that you have to only wear sarees starting at you know the age of 19 after my son was born which was two and a half years i sat to myself and i thought i really wanted to wear a churidar what do i do i went for shopping and i bought like six of them not just one it's not about me satisfying my thirst or wearing it in secret i want to make it public like i really wanted to break that fear of why is somebody holding me back on this and i want to live the way i want to live so i went and shopped like six at a time i brought home it's not that people were adamant about it that i shouldn't wear it's just their expectation and when i started wearing nobody said anything the fear that you hold yourself back and and when i started wearing i think things went normal and that is where i realized you had to break your own fear nobody else can do it and when you can brush your own cobwebs and make the path clear for you you can accomplish what you really want to accomplish and if we are pointing on somebody else limiting us to do that which means we are not doing a good job of breaking it ourselves yep take responsibility versus blame the world or the situation right me yeah. and i don't have a problem even my mother in law comes with me now to shop my jeans no problem so you basically took control and defined the narrative versus letting anybody else do it i love it let's shift gears a little bit bhavani so from a small town now we moved to a big city and then to one of the largest companies in the us a completely different culture a new environment a new lingo how did you traverse this journey and what kind of fears did you experience did you feel imposter syndrome share some anecdotes on how did you navigate your way through it i think it's a great question that anyone can associate who may have gone through a change and in my context i think the change was not sudden and gradual where it gave me enough opportunity to adapt to the new situations new culture new language thankfully i had some time when i moved to a city in india from a small town there was this comfort level around the language although the corporate world was new and navigating through the politics was something that you have to observe learn but i think by then i had some good people around me who helped me coach the right way but when it comes to imposter syndrome i never had doubt about whether i'm good enough for something i always had this doubt of am i good in english can i use the right choice of words to be able to convey my message effectively and that's not something i'm comfortable with even today i always reflect on what i'm saying what i'm using and i try to stick to simple words as sudha murthy once mentioned right you don't need to use complex words to deliver a message stick to basic be easy to help people understand what exactly you're saying and that has been helping me in a way that with simple words how i can start communicating although it may sometimes take some time to get there right but it's a great journey for me in terms of observing understanding the cultures and being able to adapt to that most importantly trying to get to that point of be a roman in rome so that you become one of them and that that is a process i would say it's an evolution and not something that you can get overnight you know i think you're working for a largely male dominated industry with multiple stakeholders i think you will be the best person to help us understand a little bit about your role and then we will segue into leadership questions my current company that i'm working on is ge which i have been part of for the last 15 years and where i have grown as a person and as a leader naturally <laughs> through the great culture in the company one thing that i would really credit to is the amount of opportunities i got in terms of 
experimenting various roles and various technologies and be able to learn many things in a very short duration. It helped me pick up an important career objective, which is business transformation. And this business transformation is enabled by the ERP technology in the space that I'm working on, which gives me opportunity to be able to go to multiple manufacturing or servicing shops in the industry and be able to digitize them, give them a better life with IT solutions than what they were doing before, and by helping the companies to be able to scale leveraging those technologies. And that's not easy because change itself is not easy. As myself, one who have gone through a lot of change personally on my own, I can understand the individuals who one could be resistant to change, who could be fear of change, or three, who cannot easily adopt to the new style of change. I'm currently working for GE Aerospace Business, which was originally part of a big conglomerate that had 11 different verticals under it. And I had the great opportunity to work in multiple different GE businesses, now landed in aerospace, where GE makes engines for all the commercial, military, and business jets. So I'm sure a GE engine takes off every two seconds. And if you are an airline traveler, and if you are traveling on either a four-hour flight or an eight-hour flight or even longer, there are chances that seven out of 10 times you're on a GE engine. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and my responsibility in this company is to help with the same digital solutions for the maintenance, repair, and overhaul segment of the business. Where if you think about your car going for a service or a major maintenance, or if the engine is so much used, then you have to go through a full overhaul. The same way aircraft engines also come to the maintenance repair overhaul shops to be able to you know, get their minor repair done or a major overhaul done. We provide the IT solutions to support that process. In an industry where safety is 99.99% important, because at any given time, there are about 400,000 people in air and the lives of all of those matters. And the company logo that we always live by is lift people up and bring them home safely. Wow. We take that as the genealogy in the DNA of every individual who's even providing an IT solutions to ensure that they're delivered with utmost safety and quality. And with that purpose behind you, it keeps you going when you're working for a purpose. That's what helps you be successful and stay motivated in that continued journey of serving the people, serving the world. Um, and at some point, you don't feel like you're working for a paycheck, you're working for a company. It's more like I'm working on a purpose that is helping connect the world. That is so beautiful, Bhavani. And, you know, I'm very closely linked with a not-for-profit called Jai Vakil Foundation. As a team coach, I help our team understand purpose and build culture. Today, speaking to you in the for-profit space and, you know, hearing your passion on focusing on purpose is just very heartwarming and very reassuring to know that this is also a reality. And, you know, it's not impossible for people to understand purpose. That's amazing. There were so many questions which came to my mind when I was listening to you. Since we are all in that positive frame of mind, share with us what are your joys as a leader? in this transformational space? I think the first thing that comes to my mind as a leader is, why should I follow this leader? Whether it is a leader in your company or a leader in your nation or anybody else, why should I follow this person? Because we believe that this person will do some good to you. And the first quality that naturally comes is the person empathetic enough to understand where I stand and how to help me get to the next level. And that is the first criteria that I look for any leader to be able to understand what they're going through and be able to help with them. And the second one that I think about is problem solving as a leader. A person is seen as someone who can solve a problem, is someone who has always an answer to a question. And that's where the person who's everybody looking up to always have to have that problem solving mindset to be able to address some of these questions. 
Third one that I wanted to say is the courage. As a leader, you should be able to jump into the ocean first to know the depth of it before you ask someone to jump into it. So those are the three things. And when I think about the joy as a leader, if I am able to have an opportunity to experience or give any of this to someone who is looking up to me, that's epiphany to me. Any examples come to your mind where you felt very accomplished or, you know, okay, today I've done my job as a leader? When there are situations where you continue to coach or mentor individuals in terms of helping them overcome their fears, overcome their opportunities, and finally when they get promoted because you were able to help them, it's not because I'm in the power of the position to promote them, but because they truly are at a point where they deserve it is probably the happiest day in my life. I love that. Yeah. Bhavani, what do you think of vulnerability as a skill? And are you able to bring vulnerability in your leadership journey? It's my favorite topic, to be honest. If you are not vulnerable, you're not trusted as an individual, let alone a leader. And there are these questions. As a leader, how often should I cry? I'm like, this is not about crying. This is about you opening the transparency doors to others to be able to see through you for who you are. And if I have to say that I am having a bad day and I need some rest to be able to recover myself, I should be okay saying that in front of people. It's okay. There is no need to put a straight face and go to work and internally when things are boiling in you and you don't have the right state of mind to be able to deal with your day-to-day issues. And I think when you do that, when you are open to people about what you are going through, then one, they understand where you are. They may be able to help you. If you are ready to accept it or not is up to you. But I'm sure people are kind enough to understand that. And it helps build trust, which is extremely important in any relationship. It also gives them permission to be vulnerable. Leaders showing vulnerability also allows them that they can talk about what's going on in their head inside. Exactly. Yeah. Lovely. Share with us a challenging experience as you traversed your journey in corporate America. I probably came in to America in a generation where a lot of diversity and inclusion was already taking a shape. And I know a lot of the predecessors may have had more challenges than I faced, but I think I was fortunate enough to come in at a point where there's a lot of appreciation for diversity and you can be who you are, which was very much appreciated. Like, for example, I wait for summers to take out my Indian outfits to wear for work. And I don't really feel guilty about it at all because this is you celebrating yourselves and your culture, which makes you comfortable and feel good. When it comes to work-related challenges, there are some preconceived notions about how we deliver work or how we deliver a message. I think the biggest cultural barrier that I faced was when you receive a feedback, you have to understand what that feedback is. But naturally, the culture that I grew up was more of, you have to put a justification out there saying, okay, this is why I did it. And my learning in the corporate industry was, you may have your own reasons, zip it up. But when somebody is giving you feedback, take it, understand the point where the person is coming from, And that is the biggest change that I have to adjust to, where the natural instinct is to go in and justify what you're, why you did it, which I think is an important transformation for me to be able to listen the point of view of the other person before I jump in and say, this is why I did it. There are some interesting aspects in every culture that you learn. And I think in the U.S., that's one important thing that I learned is how do you pay more attention? How do you listen to the other person? How do you understand where they're coming from and what's their point of view? And when somebody's telling you something, you pay attention to the why, then what? I think once I I started adopting to some of those things, I'm not saying I'm perfect, I'm learning. Then people see you as someone who's transforming and you're seen as someone who can be invested in, who can be trusted in, you know, to give bigger responsibilities. 
I really appreciate the way you've sort of shared your journey on how you've evolved as a person. So I'm wondering then in this journey, who were your go-to people? Like, were there any mentors in your journey who are or were your role models to help you, to provide you that safe space? Because that's also a challenge in the corporate world. Forget corporate America. Well, I think inspiration I take from a lot of women. Support I took from a lot of men in my life, starting with my father, my father-in-law, who has always seen me as someone special. My husband, my son, who has supported me in pretty much every guilt factor that I would have associated myself with and in the corporate world, even though it's a lot of male colleagues around, I'm sure without all of their support, I wouldn't have been here. When it comes to inspiration and motivation, you know, the first time where I took the example of Mrs. Sudha Murthy, she was the one who challenged on why a job wasn't posted to female applicants to apply. And that was the first thought that came to me in terms of, oh, you can question certain things on why you were not given an opportunity about something you think you can do, but other may not, others may not think you can do it. I think from there, I don't specifically say, hey, these are the role models that I look up to. Emma, name it. While growing up, Kiran Bedi was someone who I looked up to. A lot of women who can tell you, you know, there is a different dimension to a woman that you can still explore, including a woman who is probably doing 12 hours of a job to support her family. To make the ends meet inspires me because, you know, that's that additional responsibilities that they take care to make sure they give their best to their family. Not just the women who excel in their career, but also the women who, you know, who are burning candle on the both sides to make their family and the world a better place. I think I I really get inspired on a daily basis. So I cannot just pinpoint on one person or one individual too. I want to double click on how your husband supported you because I think I truly believe and, you know, I'm, this is coming from a place of, of course, me, myself. And I know what I've been able to do is only because of my husband's support. But I was just reflecting this morning. I spoke to an amazing lady called Annette Phillips. She's a musician and a composer in Berkeley. And then, of course, as we talk, we finished 23 conversations. And uh, Bhavani, my reflection truly was that all the women who have actually spoken about how their husbands have you know, supported them or been their cheerleaders. I can see that those women have come from a place of pure joy. That was such a clear theme coming out. Love you to share your journey. I Even if you have to backtrack a little bit on how he has helped you thus far. Yeah, it's a great question. And maybe along with my mom, dad, and my father-in-law, mother-in-law, my husband, you know, all of these people that I need to pay my tribute in terms of shaping that early career journey for me. My husband has his own life in the small town, but when I told him I want to study, he said, okay. But when I asked him, hey, we should move to a big city for me to get a better job and you can ignore whatever you're doing, he was still supporting. He said, okay, go ahead, figure out what you can do. I'll take care of the son. So he encouraged me to go settle in the big city until I got a corporate job where I said, hey, this is not working out, you know. It's not about the distance relationship, but it's all about, hey, can we stay together as a family? And he was very appreciative of moving in to the big city along with me. And he had to restart his life. While he was doing that, any time where he found that I was in that contentment state, he was the one who kicked me and said, go, you can do better. And the trust he had in me always inspired me in terms of you know, just same like my dad. Okay, am I not good enough for my husband? Is he expecting more from me? Or, you know, is this that inherent ability that he sees in me that I don't see myself? So maybe, maybe I should try this. So with his encouragement, although I was an individual contributor at some point, he challenged me to take a leadership role. And that's when I joined the IT Six Sigma Black Belt, which gave me exposure to various levels of work in the organization, which suddenly exploded my world into multiple dimensions. And when we were going through that career, there were multiple points where he encouraged me to take up bigger and better jobs. And obviously, when you take on something, 
even though you have a lot of courage and confidence in terms of how you can do it, there will be a little bit of child in you who is scared for a minute. And my go-to person at that point is my husband where I can be vulnerable with him and say, do you think I can do this? And I think at that point is when he always told me what I could do and what my potential is. So that joy is what you can see me when I'm talking. Absolutely. And very recently I heard about this, which made me reflect too, right? One of, I don't recall exactly who said, but I think she told me there has to be an extremely strong man to be able to deal with a strong woman like you. I want to meet that person. I'm like, Okay, I never thought about my husband that way. Maybe he must have been super strong compared to me because he was putting up with me. <laughs> That's very inspiring, Bhavani. Any mistakes in your journey and with the wisdom of hindsight, you know, how would you do them differently? When you are moving in a journey from a small town to a city, navigating from a village life towards a corporate leadership role, your definitions of success is hard work. Your definition of success is commitment, ability to learn. And when you see people who cannot bring those values to the table, you get frustrated about it. Why can't they do this properly? Why can't they put their full self into it to be able to accomplish that job? This was my early career mindset about people. But when I was able to understand in terms of why they are not able to bring their full self in terms of it's not about intentions. It's about their inability to do certain things the way you can do is where my learning had started. And in hindsight, if I go back, I probably should have changed my thought process about how I see others, the success definition for others, the definition of happiness for others. Yeah, I regret now, but am I guilty about it? No, because that's no longer the barrier that I'm holding for myself and which I think is personally good for me <laughs> in a way that I could see people for who they are and not for what they deliver. Yeah, I think sometimes we feel, oh, if I'm like this, why is the other person not like this? And that journey actually starts at home. Like I've got two young boys at 25 and 23 and I can totally see how I have let go in the last five years. You know, five years back, I would say, I'm your mother and it's my job to ensure that you're successful versus understanding that is their journey and I'm there to support them if and when they need me. Otherwise, I have to completely let go. So I totally get where you're coming from. Absolutely. Kids teach you a lot. Totally. I mean, I tell everyone, they're my mentors today, you know. I have a son who always keeps me on my toes too, challenging my opinions about certain things and of course we conquer to them because of the logic they bring into the conversation and it's amazing. I don't think I had that intellectual at that age when I reflect on myself so I was probably too innocent. So true. Bhavani, what's the one toolkit you always carry in your toolbox no matter what project you're working on? It's the problem solving mindset. Hmm. You know from this it takes me to what you spoke about, how your husband pushed you to be from an individual contributor to a leader. I want to double click a little bit more on that. And this is especially because you're talking about your problem solving mindset. You know, somebody who's such a problem solver, somebody who drives uh, passion and excitement in solving the problem herself. How did you then embrace the role of a leader? And uh, how did you start enjoying that part of your journey? Well, that's an interesting and an intriguing question. And you hit on the right point there. As an individual contributor, you're expected to solve problems. As a leader, you're expected to aid problem solving and not solve by yourselves. So when I was really at my peak in terms of enjoying my role, where I was doing big upgrades and you know, being that queen in the technology, with the Women's Network event, I happened to meet one of the leaders who was leading an individual GE business entity in India. Her name was Reema Bhattar. We were having a casual chat where she was talking to me on a note and I had this question. I said, Reema, in India, unless you have a manager tag, I don't think you're respected as a technologist. Unlike in other countries where 
if you have 25 years of technology expertise under your belt, you are well-respected. Why cannot I grow as a technologist for, say, next two decades? And then she asked me, you may have been overjoyed about your accomplishments in the technology that you're working on, but think about this. Technology is not long-lasting. It changes. It evolves, which means you have to upgrade yourselves to be a niche technologist at any point. On the other side, if you think about whether you are leading 100 boxes or you are leading 100 people who are in turn leading 100 boxes, the value that you are contributing your company is much more. And that is why the leaders are respected because their value is exponential with the amount of value that they can bring in with you know, the hands and brains that they are able to inspire. And she told me, keeping that conversation aside, Bhavani, I think you have natural leadership skills in you, and I think you should try that path, which, again, you don't know who you are. Somebody has to tell you. Like, my husband has been kicking me, and in this case, Rima kicked me into the leadership position for me to be able to even pursue that opportunity and say, okay, let me try this role. And I think there is no looking back and... And to your question in terms of how did you manage to navigate into a leader where a solution comes to your mind, but you have to hold on to it and attribute to your team who's coming up with probably even a better solution or a brighter solution. That's a challenge because you have to navigate them towards giving the best solution, even though you know how it can be solved. You always have to keep telling yourselves there's a best idea out there and let the team figure it out. And it took a lot of time for me to practice, not jump into the problem solving, but be there for people. But again, even as a leader, there are problems that you have to solve on your own. That makes a lot of sense. You know, now that we've sort of visualized you as this leader, Bhavani, I did this research with around 300 women just before I started Atlanta Diaries. I was very clear that I want to offer my women clients uh, multiple perspectives, but still I thought, let me do my research to be completely sure. And I'd love to get your perspective. For example, a lot of women said that women have to prove their point, whereas men have to simply state it. What are your thoughts on that and any anecdotes where you experienced this and how did you deal with it? I think it's a great question and an interesting analysis over there as well in terms of how the gender naturally comes to you to be sure that you have all your data points to prove your point. And I think women naturally does that. Even though a statement is enough, like a man, try making a statement and see what happens. Why do you have to have the baggage to prove your point? But we do the research naturally because we want to be 100% sure about what we are suggesting. And I don't deny I did that. I used to have all of my backing ready to be able to tell the story. But at some point, I've realized I just need to tell what is needed at that time and don't have to back it up, which could eventually look too defensive on my side. So you were mindful of the fact that uh, there is this bias. So you were more than well prepared to ensure that, uh, you know, you're coming out strong and not convincing, but stating backed with enough data. Pamani, I want to backtrack a little bit. You know, there was a whole journey before you joined G. And you mentioned to me last time that when you didn't get respected, you quit. Not because you were a quitter, but you wanted to highlight was that when you don't get respected, you quit. Can you share examples of when you felt disrespected? And with the wisdom of hindsight, would you do it differently? It was not an easy decision to quit things, right? Because generally you don't like to give up. You want to prove yourselves to do it. But when it comes to respect, even today I walk out. Let me share a little personal example here on why I do that. I've been having this little conversation with one of my friends where she had a personal story going on where she mentioned that she did everything that she could do to support a family, but yet not respected by someone. Again, I'm not taking names or associating any relationship here. And she was really unhappy about it. 
and and it got me thinking that unless you demand respect in a relationship you can just take it for granted it's not just about work it's about whether you're respect as a daughter in law it's about whether you're respect as women colleague as a wife as a mother and you may have experienced this too i think we should hold our ground for respect and be able to walk out if you are not given one because it's important for you or let them know how important you are in that particular position for them and my decision back in the days was more about when i did not get respect and when i did not see line of sight to how that story can be turned over and there is no point for me to prove that hey i can do this to earn respect but when you are at a point where it's just not worth it you work out and i'm not saying that's what everybody should do for me personally i think as a human being you demand respect to be treated equally you demand respect to be treated fairly and those are the two grounds that i want to still hold on in the hindsight would i have not taken a decision i don't think so i'm still standing for my decision at that point or not at just that point in certain circumstances where i had to stand up for my respect just so that you're you're not demeaned <laughs> yeah i know you're very passionate about helping younger women or other women understanding and mentoring them so before we end the conversation love to know from you a little bit about your mentoring journey like how are you helping women or encouraging them to not give up if you had to turn back the clock and talk to your younger self what would you tell her i'll start with my younger self okay i felt that my initial career days were a little slower and if i have to tell myself i would have dropped my fears much faster than i did and started to learn more in the early career stages where i probably was content for a few years for all the other women that i am mentoring every woman or most of the women that i spoke to has a unique challenge that they are facing and i traveled a lot i covered like 24 countries as part of either work or travel and every time i go there i observe the situations of women in terms of how different they are from the other country and what kind of social expectations are there on them and you know what there is a common thread across no matter whether it is an underdeveloped nation or a developed nation or being developed nation i think the common thread that i noticed is the expectations on women about owning the children taking care of them is not going anywhere so there's a natural expectation on women that they have to attend the pti meetings they have to make sure the scores are good they have to make sure the requirements of all the kids are taken care of very well and i'm sure there are some wonderful men who are sharing that responsibility but naturally when you think about the expectation it's more on the women where women carry that pressure and i'll tell you a story that i had to listen from one of my colleagues who i was mentoring and she said bhavani i love being an independent woman i love being in workforce but guess what happens at my house we stay with our in-laws they are retired and they're living their happy life i have two children i make sure everybody is fed in the morning and pack their lunch boxes to go to the school and i go to work and because of the united states overlap typically the work hours are longer in the afternoon i try to get out of the office by 5 go back home take a 2 hour break and then connect so i can continue my work responsibilities but for any reason if my calls get longer and my meetings get extended where i'm not able to get out of the office by 5 pm guess what my kids will sit starving waiting for me at my house until i come back so that is the support women need there are elderly parents in the house who don't think their daughter should be working and their way of expressing that is by not taking care of the kids and naturally the husband won't help because his parents think that he shouldn't be doing those chores so when it comes to a balance it's not about women being in the workforce it's about the situations and the conditions and the help they get from the society and family to be able to do that 
she's trying to balance her work and her kids who are the most important things in her life and i coached her have a conversation with your husband in terms of sharing the duties and responsibilities it is extremely important for you to know where they stand in terms of supporting you and your career and because it is the same company i had an opportunity to coach her manager also to help explain the situation to see if he can be supportive of that 2 hours where she can take care of the family and get back to work and take care of the work mm. so this is a mentoring network which is within ge itself that leaders have to mentor other women ge has a huge women's network organization where internally and externally i had this opportunity to help other women at least express their problems and situations i'm not saying i'm solving every problem here but with my experiences i was able to give some tips on how can they navigate or at least sometimes be an ear to share their stories so that they know that they're not facing these problems alone yeah a safe space i think this is a beautiful way to end the conversation you know and it totally ties into the mission of atlanta diaries bhavani so since you know atlanta diaries is a place where aspiring women leaders learn and and learn their definitions of success what are your parting thoughts for these leaders as they transition into larger roles first of all congratulations to you in establishing such a wonderful forum for people to come in and talk and share their journeys and you never know where the button clicks thank you very much but even if it could change one life or inspire a young girl in a small little town or a village i think the whole purpose is accomplished and i think congratulations to you in terms of driving the mission on that purpose emma um it's not just easy to be consistent you know to be able to learn from 23 wonderful inspiring women of the world in terms of my parting words for for the audience who probably will be interested in listening till the end is one be empathetic to the other situations so you know exactly what they are going through when you know the root cause you will know how to solve the problem or you can at least advise how to solve the problem two be confident in terms of anything that you are taking up do your homework but trust yourselves first to be able to do that thank you very much for taking out time 24 countries you didn't complete the sentence in one year or 6 months but i can only imagine how busy you are and i really appreciate making this important for you thank you very much for listening all my guests have brought their most vulnerable selves on atlanta diaries and even if a small segment of these conversations can help champion the journey of one person It's going to be really worth it. I do have a request for you. Please share this podcast on your social media and with your family and friends. Our society is constantly evolving and Atlanta Diaries must too. I really appreciate if you can leave your feedback in the form of a review or a rating. These are impactful and rousing stories that need to be shared far and wide. See you next time for another one on Atlanta Diaries.